Um, yeah, look, this will be a, uh, um, a whirlwind tour of just what's going on in our project. Uh, and uh, I'd first of all, like to acknowledge the project team. Uh, they've all had valuable inputs into it. And, uh, and I think we'd have to say that we've had a fair bit of fun. It was fairly open, slather as to the technologies we looked at. And, uh, and one thing I should add is that when I started this project, uh, I only had two children and now I've got four. So um, if the CRC wants to claim those as outputs, they're welcome to do that, but I'll be just glad that the project's ended. So um, um, look, the, the opportunities uh, that are sort of as in the context as we'd expect them, we're just looking at new technologies that we're gonna be applicable to um, broad scale surveillance in the grains industry, that was to detect either endemics or exotics, um, but whether that's at local or regional or national interests and from a biosecurity point of view, um, obviously that's particularly applicable from a national interest. The, the underwriters to this was, was the GRDC, they're the ones that embedded this project into the, to the, uh, the CRC and, and, um, and really drove, drove the initiative. Um, I'm not going to tell you what we didn't look at as far as the technology um, or that what we, all of the technology we looked at. I'm just going to really talk about really the ones that we carried through to the end. Uh, and they're really going to be all focused around the trapping type of technologies. That's basically the area of um, surveillance that we chose was going to give us the best bang for buck. Um, we were looking at technologies that could be species specific or compatible to systems that were... Um, being able to output species specific detection. Um, uh, the sensors uh, obviously that we started bringing into this uh, project were those that could be automated because there's a lot of developments and new technologies around electronics and digital imagery. Uh, but also uh, smart capture became a, a real standout feature which I'll detail and that is trying to put more data associated with the samples that we collected um, and everything we're trying to progress is really to progress it toward rapid diagnostics and, and uh, compatibility to sort of wireless transmission of information. So I'm going to outline, outline um, sort of three essential areas that we've, we've really produced some, some really interesting pieces of kit, so to speak. Um, the, uh, the one is the smart insect moth traps, which I'll, I'll just touch on briefly, and that's their infield capture systems around digital um, technology. There'll be suction traps which are applicable to insect capture and then suction traps that are um, applicable to pathogens. Does, um, and uh, those ones are uh, the ones where the, the lab qPCR um, diagnostics are the, the underlying means of detection. Um, and, uh, and really I'd sort of like to highlight a, the team effort, including a couple of partners, Rothamsted Research and Burkhard Manufacturing that really assisted ourselves and, and uh, the USQ uh, guys to, to really progress some really interesting pieces of um, equipment. So uh, firstly, the, the, the smart moth traps. Um, these were using the pheromone-based lures. Uh, they used digital capture. Um, they had a, um, Les Zeller and his crew were able to come up with a fairly unique little design where the trap itself would just uh, self-monitor uh, if, if there was a trap, if there was a target caught within it, it would uh, basically capture an image of that. It would beam it up via 4G telemetry to a, a web portal. And uh, you can see a couple of images there of examples of, of doing that. And they were time-stamped images uh, to verify um, uh, the target. Um, and we're really just using the same principles of a lure-based system, uh, which is really what conventional traps use. Um, obviously, we're doing this in the context of what's going to be commercially viable or what can be commercialised. Um, it's very difficult to, to do this once you start looking at a device that's robust, that can weatherproof, whether it can withstand uh, all sorts of debris and um, problems with maintaining power and what have you. Uh, also, pheromones themselves are just not bulletproof. Are they always available? Are they stackable? We looked at that. There are complexities behind that I won't necessarily go into. Um, but, um, but really, um, the end user point of view, it's, it's really got to be a fairly steady, reliable data flow. Um, and can it be sort of adapted to new sort of maybe uh, visual computer vision systems? Um, when we started this, there were really no systems that were available commercially, but uh, now that we've come, in to come to the end of it, there are sort of four or five that are now available through various companies. Even CSIRO have developed a rapid aim 
um, and uh, Adama with Trap View, and there's a couple of emerging ones. But some of those ones, and maybe the ones arguably which will be the winners of this, uh, will be the ones that start adapting newer telemetry systems which are built around, say, the Internet of Things where you're using low power, wide area network, where you can move data a lot more effectively and it's a more compatible to the regional, um, sort of, you know, uh, in the regions where you might not always have 4G technology, 4G coverage rather. Um, okay, moving on to uh, the second set of devices, which is around the insect surveillance. These are a couple of suction traps that uh, we both evaluated or developed. Um, you see the top one there was a, pr a prototype out of Burkhard Manufacturing in the UK. It's, um, look, there's not a whole lot of smarts to it in the sense of it just really sucks into pots and has a carousel system which can then just have a time, uh, a really just sort of a time based change of the sampling, but um, it really became a, a real great workhorse in this project as to this means of platform to, uh, to test, and I'll, I'll go on that, I'll, I'll talk about that. The other one was a smart insect suction trap that Les Zeller and his crew USQ developed. Uh, that was aimed to be more efficient, a 12 volt system, and give us a lot more information behind the capture and also the control of how we capture, which I'll detail. So looking at these two Burkhard systems, uh, they became really valuable at just monitoring a lot of aphid uh, samples and, uh, and they have been really uh, in, in, uh, out there in the field working since uh, early 2016 and here you can just see uh, the diversity and number of aphids that are captured at three different sites using, these, uh, using this device uh, and then we narrowed it down to a very specific target, in this case green peach aphid and providing a lot of valuable information that uh, becomes a, a seasonal profile of how green peach aphid behaves uh, throughout the season, when it peaks, when it drops. And, uh, and these, these numbers are uh, based on visual identification. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sort of talk about why we want to see that change. But it really, um, it proved the concept that the suction traps were actually a good means of uh, looking at a range of targets. And speaking of, when we started the project, Russian wheat aphid was our biosecurity target that we were wanting to prove that we could come up with a system that could monitor for it. Uh, as it turns out that not only did we come up with a system that uh, proved it could monitor, monitor for it, but it proved that it did monitor for it because we had the incursion um, back in uh, 2016. Um, and, uh, and interestingly enough, when the incursion was reported, uh, which was, um, I think sometime in, in June, um, we then were able to look back at uh, one of our samples of this suction trap and we found a, green, a uh, Russian wheat aphid in that, which retrospectively became kind of the, the first one that was captured at least. Or, um, and so it, it became a, literally a proof of concept, um, even though it was originally meant to be uh, a target of what we were going to sort of monitor for. Um, and we're able to compare this suction trap system to what is fairly more generically used to monitor. Uh, you can see the yellow tray there is uh, yellow pan traps there. They're used to, um, to monitor for aphids by entomologists as a, a fairly standard method, um, sort of a method of, of doing this. And we're able to find that the suction traps was comparable, if not better in many instances, uh, as an actual platform to monitor for the aphid. Uh, to, compared to a fairly laborious and, and uh, uh, system of the yellow pan traps. Um, and then the other thing we wanted to do was, okay, that were the aphid type species. Um, how can we value add to this suction trap in, in other means? Uh, what uh, I ended up doing was adding a, a, a near UV light, uh, UVB uh, to LED system to this suction trap. And uh, what you can see here is that the photograph uh, shows um, the, the, the different types of moth species that were able to be caught in this trap. They would actually splay out quite nicely a, across the glycol um, pot. Um, and what it really showed, and you look at the graph there, the, the blue um, bars um, show the types of targets that were caught when you never used light on this suction trap, and you can see they're dominated by uh, uh, you know, all sorts of wasps and aphids and small insects that would normally be just caught uh, throughout the day. 
once you started adding um, light to it, then you're able to then see on those orange bars that we're starting to increase a, a broader array of targets that we could actually capture in it. And that started to include uh, mosquitoes and moths and things like that. So just going to show that the same device could be used by just a tweak or an addition uh, as something as simple as UVB light to then say, well, we can use it to have a look at other things as well. And that type of image then uh, lends itself to uh, some new opportunities for com computer vision uh, training uh, that might be able to help identify with the, the catch. Um, I mentioned uh, about uh, Les's smart moth trap, um, a smart suction trap rather. Uh, when I say smarts, this is a, a, a trap that can uh, capture according to temperature, wind direction, wind speed, uh, uh, time of day, and things like that. And that really opens up a, a whole uh, a series of opportunities in regards to how we um, suck and see for, um, for insect pests. Um, here you can see that uh, when the device was set on what we refer to as a, a, um, a, a daily time cycle, so the, basically the trap just repeats itself each day and but breaks up the day into eight pots of, uh, of a different time bracket, we can start seeing that, um, according to that graph, you start seeing how the, the different insect groups are caught in the different times of day. If you just concentrate on thrips there with the tallest um, bar lines there, you can see that uh, in the hours in the middle there, the blue and green represents sort of midday through to sort of five o'clock, um, when really most of the thrips were target were actually captured in that trap. So that actually helps a lot with maybe optimising trapping um, techniques. You know, that we, there's not necessarily the need to be trapping continuously 24 hours a day. We could just target certain times of day, uh, but it also provides valuable information onto insect behaviour and and uh, and all sort of all sorts of information that can be fed through to the um, uh, to sort of optimising not just the surveillance side of things, but also providing valuable information on the pests. Um, I mentioned how a lot of the data, particularly on aphids, was visually um, uh, identified, and and uh, and that's been a, a lot of work uh, to our taxonomist. Um, Helen uh, Brody, she, uh, um, she actually had done a lot of those counts. So we want to migrate the uh, detection and diagnostics of these targets through to the uh, molecular um, tools and we've got the Molecular Diagnostic Centre at SARDI. We, we then uh, went about a proof of concept using a couple of available, one available primers which is Western Flower Thrip and uh, one that was developed by uh, Dr. Kelly Hill in, in green peach aphid to just show whether we were able to identify as low as just a single aphid in this pot, uh, this mixture. And, and this little table just um, shows that using the, the pots of insects that we were collecting off these suction traps, when we went about spiking it, we were able to see that we could count as low as a single aphid uh, amongst that. Okay, just moving on to the uh, spore trapping work. Um, one of the really interesting um, outputs of this, um, this work has been developed what we call the mobile jet sampler. There's a little video there if you just want to hit that while I'm talking. Um, thanks. And um, that was developed by, by Burkhart as well as uh, uh, in evaluation with Rothamsted and the USQ group. This is a high volume uh, spore sampler that attaches to the roof of a vehicle. And, uh, and uses a, an auxiliary power source to pull in um, spores using a virtual sort of impaction system. Um, just play that video as well, if you don't mind. What we do is we load up a set of GPS polygons into this device, and as we travel through the, the landscape, it changes uh, the, the, the tube position according to which polygon we've entered. And, uh, and samples the air within that uh, particular area. We take those tubes back to the laboratory where we're able to use the, um, thanks, the, able to use the molecular diagnostic center and specific uh, PCR um, primers to identify the pathogens of interest. And so that becomes a fast track means of identifying spores that we've captured in the air at a very certain, certain space of time. And here's a couple of just visual outputs of it where we see that this is using black leg of canola. We can see that the size of the circle represents the amount of time that was spent in that location and the colour represents the low or medium high result. And so there you can see a fairly, uh, you know, a, a pathogen that's fairly widely occurring through a, a broad landscape. 
whereas um, the other interest one was the opportunity for biosecurity one. And here's a target, while it's not a biosecurity target, it shows that we'd expect a lot of zeros to be shown up for this. It's not a, it's not a wide ranging pathogen, but you can see that that little target there uh, in the mid north there, we were able to, to uh, capture that uh, one event. And ironically, that was the trial side of the collaborator of doing that. And just finishing up, we've, we're comparing this against a range of other samplers. Um, the idea of passing through a landscape at any given point of time, uh, we need to see whether that is a, an advantage or disadvantage. Uh, these, these graphs just picking out three different pathogens of interest where we're comparing the jet sampler that passed through only for a matter of minutes compared to a sampler that would operate for say 15 minutes or a sample that would operate for five hours or an entire day. And it's, it really just emphasises that certain pathogens are going to maybe require a certain time of sampling that, um, that in some instances the jet sampler was optimal for. In other instances, you need a, a, another sampler to do that same trick. I think I'll probably move on from there because time permits. Uh, this is just a schematic of the, uh, of the actual devices that contribute into the Molecular Diagnostic Centre or other digital analysis and potential outputs of how we visualise this information to be viewed. And uh, look, I just thank very much a lot, of, a lot of people that contributed, including the GRDC's investment in the plant biosecurity. Thanks very much.